thank you all for coming. Thank you for taking the time. So I just want to introduce myself briefly. I'm Kate Culver. I'm a permaculture designer, a natural builder. I am uh, also a mentor. I work with individuals on, that, are, that are caregivers and activists to make their lives more joyful and more effective. And I also have a program where I work with children and uh, we do nature connection and power, youth, youth empowerment. So um, I also live with my husband, Howard Schweitzer, who you might know. We've been active with the Green Party since 2000. Uh, we live off the grid in a straw bale house in rural Tennessee, uh, overlooking the Buffalo River. So I have a very wonderful uh, lifestyle and does that help? Okay, um, hopefully that won't make the picture uncomfortable. So um, I was just curious, we're here to talk about political permaculture and so to start I want to hear some words that you think of when you hear the word political. Just share some words that what, what does the word political bring up for you? <laughs> Contentious. Contentious, bad. Depends on the context. Depends on the context. Positive or sometimes it's angry and sometimes it's boring city council meeting. <laughs> right. So what we're really hearing here is it's really not generally uplifting or positive. It, it can be positive for Holly. <laughs> um, so what if, what if our work because we're all here to do this work, right? This is why we're here, is to do political work. And why would we want to do something that wasn't uplifting for us and made us feel good and made us feel like we were being effective in the world? And what could be more effective? Well, one possibility is something that I call political permaculture. And I'm going to figure out how to work this computer here. Um, this is a quote from Starhawk who is a great permaculture teacher and a consummate activist. And she says that one anecdote to our politically charged times is permaculture. <laughs> Ecological design to meet human needs while regenerating the environment, especially when it's grounded in spirit and taught with a focus on organizing and activism. And this is why I sought out Starhawk for my permaculture teacher, because I really wanted to understand permaculture in contact with activism and how to get it out there in the world. And we've all experienced the struggle, right? This is the work that we've been doing for a long time. I've certainly been there. I've got the buttons and the t-shirts and the bumper stickers. In fact, I have struggled down this path for almost 40 years working to make a difference. And for nearly two decades of that, I did it as a single parent, a single mother. Uh, still making time to go to meetings, to go to protests, to rallies, to write articles, to write letters, doing all the things that I wanted to do to make a difference. Even while struggling, and as a single mom, I put $5,000 on a credit card to go to Rio, Rio de Janeiro to the Earth Summit in 1992 because I wanted to fight the good fight. And often that meant that I was leaving my children home to fight the good fight by themselves. So I didn't nurture my family the way I wished I had. I wasn't nurturing myself the way I needed and deserved. And I, in the end, was not nurturing the earth. So because of the energy I was expending, it was no energy. It was against energy. So even though I might have been carrying a peace sign, I was saying stop the nukes and stop the war and shut this down. And, don't do that. I was simply perpetrating the very negativity that I perceived in the world and that I wanted to change. So during that time, I loved the quote, Gandhi's quote, be the change you want to see in the world. And I wore it like a badge of honor. <laughs> and I really thought that it meant go out and be an activist and tell those bad people what they're doing wrong. <laughs> and it took me a long time to understand just how misdirected my interpretation of this quote was. So in hindsight, I can see why I wasn't effective as an activist, and I can see why we have not been successful as activists in changing our current paradigm. So about five or six years ago, I started on a journey to shift. I was going to shift my outlook, shift my tactics. 
I even shifted my beliefs to be the change that I wanted to see in the world, like Gandhi meant to embody it. And the results have been improved health. I, I had gotten really sick where I had numbness in my hands and my arms. I was afraid to hold a glass for fear I was going to drop it on the floor. Uh, I couldn't write a check. By the time I got to my signature, my hand was so sore, you know, you couldn't even read the signature. And I also have re improved relations ships because of, of this work that I've been doing. I have more understanding, more respect, more compassion for my husband, for my family, for my community, and even that greater, broader community out there. I try to have more compassion for all. And it also improved my lifestyle. You know, I mentioned that I had lived in a straw bale house. My husband and I built this straw bale house in Tennessee. And we got to a point where it was almost done and we went ahead and moved in. And if anyone is building their old, own home, I highly encourage you to finish it before you move in. <laughs> because you get busy with life and a lot of those things just don't happen. You know, you, you overlook them or you get just busy with other things. And so I had gotten to the point where I was really angry about these little things that weren't done. And I was even shaming my husband and saying things like, you know, the cobbler's kids who have no shoes, well, I'm the architect's wife who has no house. And so through the shifting that I was able to do, I got past that and found that I could really love my home, that it's a beautiful home. And I overlook those, those little uh, inconsistencies and things that need to be done and just put them on the to-do list. Don't let them bother me. But the greatest thing I have gotten from this is time to spend with my grandchild. And she is the most precious thing to me. Um, every Thursday I travel 200 miles into town and out to spend time with her, my 200 mile Tuesday. And I pick her up early at Montessori and we spend the afternoon and the evening together because her parents work late. And it is just great, great Grammy time. You know, I, I get to take her on walks in the woods and eat wild berries and pick up rocks looking for crayfish. And it's just a, a fabulous time, something that I, I truly, truly treasure. So the amazing power of this little shift was huge on my life, on every aspect of my life. It's kind of like a lever, you know, that simple machine that you can use to create a large result by exerting just a small amount of force at one end. And the key factor is where that fulcrum is placed. So when we change that point, we can get dramatic results. And when we change our perspective, we can move obstacles with greater ease than we ever thought possible. And so not only can our efforts as Green Party people be improved, our personal lives can be improved. The time that we spend working on our cause can be reduced and have a much uh, more joyful life in, in those times that we're not doing Green Party work. So along the lines of Einstein's quote that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them, as change agents, we're unable to see the new emerging options if we still look through the old vision. We talk a lot about, in the party, we talk a lot about wanting to bring in young people and more diversity. And the truth is we cannot design diversity into a static material system like the current GP rules and bylaws. But we can build new relational and energetic models that hold diversity as an integral part of the design. Because in natural systems, Diversity is absolutely the key, the key to the power. Our world not only has many different kinds of trees, we have hundreds of oaks and hundreds of willows and thousands of butterflies and thousands of birds. So diversity is an important aspect that we, we want to nurture. Last year, our keynote speaker was Charles Eisenstein. And if you're not familiar with his work, I highly encourage you to check out his books, especially The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know is Possible. And he talked about moving from the old paradigm of being informational driven to going to a new paradigm of being more relational, more story oriented, more interactions. 
And in a relational system, people are able to self-organize and be autonomous while still being, uh, still being able to work well in collaboration. And when we create that more relational storyline, people find themselves inside the party, right? They can understand where they fit in because of that relational aspect. Um, you know, when we talk about our issues, people can understand and agree with us that the bankers run the show and that the multinational corporations and uh, the war machine, you know, manipulate our government. They can understand those things intellectually but it doesn't necessarily put them with us inside the party. So creating this more relational presentation of our message helps them see themselves in relationship with us as members of our party, and we grow the party. So we can also look at the party from an energetic level, and this is not the outreach work that the relational uh, level was. This is more an internal way of looking at party politics and how we run our organization. So what it might look like is creating a process where the party leaders and stakeholders strategize about party building to achieve a set of goals and intentions. And in that process, we look for patterns. So what is reoccurring? How is it working? How is it not working? Where are the hurdles? What are the patterns that can be identified that are holding us back? And what patterns can we identify that are working for us and that we want to enhance? And looking at the organization from this energetic perspective, we can see the experience of the work that we do, the interpersonal relationships at play, and better see how we can put ourselves into the world and bring this organization into a more cohesive and effective formula for action and moving forward. It's not reactionary, it's proactive. So let's look at this from a permaculture perspective. Planting the garden, three seeds to move from striving to thriving. Sustainability is our destination here for the organization, for ourselves, and for the planet. When we are struggling, we only have so much energy. It takes energy to survive. But when we are thriving, we actually build energy. So struggle takes energy, thriving builds energy. And we can plant three seeds today right here in this room to help us create that thriving world. So the first seed we're going to look at, whoops, 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 guess what? This thing is not giving me my nets. Oh, what a shame. Okay, the next seed, <laughs> the first seed, is building guilds. So in gardening, we have uh, what we call plant guilds. And these are plants who work synchronistically with each other. A similar technique would be companion planting, and I'm sure that we have organic gardeners in the room that understand these terms. So if you take three plants and you put them in different places in your garden, they each need to work very hard to find their food, to struggle to survive, to protect themselves. But then when you take those same plants and put them close together, they work synergistically, and they actually support each other and enhance each other's growth. So there are many guilds many, many plant guilds that we can build, but perhaps the best known in the general population is that of the Three Sisters of Indian Lore. Anyone familiar with the Three Sisters? Who are, who are our Three Sisters? Corn, beans, and squash, corn, and beans. corn, beans, and squash. Very good, yes. So corn is a staple of the diet, and it's a heavy feeder, which means it needs a lot of nitrogen to make its fruit and it gets that nitrogen from the soil. But the so nitrogen in the soil is not always easily accessible to many plants. So along come the beans, and the beans are legumes, and they're nitrogen fixers. Their very process helps make the nitrogen in the soil more accessible to other plants. That's what the corn needed. The corn takes up the nitrogen, and now the beans need something to climb on, and the corn is there with its stalk, to allow the beans to climb up the stalk, keeping the flower and the fruit up in the air, away from the ground and the, and the insects and the moisture, allowing the beans to, to um, grow their fruit well. And so then we bring in our squash, and squash is gonna be growing low to the ground. It's got big, broad leaves, so it uh, protects the ground from the sun, from the moisture in the ground from evaporating. 
Uh, it, it'll help keep down the weeds. Uh, and it just shades the ground and keeps the ground cooler in general. So the three sisters work in this synergistic partnership where they all benefit from the presence of the others. They're in flow rather than in struggle. So separating these plants in the garden makes them fight their own fight. And in that garden, weeds are able to flourish because there are voids and there are opportunities for the weeds to grow. In a thriving garden like this one, the weeds are crowded out by the flourishing plants that you put there. So, you know, a lot of times we tend to think of weeds as bad, but the plants that we call weeds all have a purpose. In some cases, they break up compacted soil with deep tap roots. They can offer flowers for bees and other beneficial insects. They have a reason for being. And if they're coming into the garden, they're there because there was a, a void, something for them to fill. It's not because they're the bad guys coming in to do harm. So when the plants we want are healthy and working together and they're in good, rich soil, the weeds don't have a reason to be there. They're not, read, they're not needed and they, for the most part, don't show up. And each of our causes is like a plant in our garden. If we work synergistically, we all thrive. And when we get past this us-them idea and see weeds in our societal garden, like the corporations and the bankers, as just being opportunistic, filling a void that was created, then we can approach their eradication from a place of the task at hand rather than from a place of victimhood. Being good guild members and creating healthy communities and families, we reduce the need for societal weeds and they just not need it. Okay, this is a rather simplistic analysis considering the fact that our societal, societal garden is completely overrun with weeds. And changing that paradigm is just not as simple as going and finding some nice fr fresh plot of ground to garden. But I think that the analogy still holds in changing our view about the good guys against the bad guys. Because when we choose not to play victim and blame others for the mess, when we take personal responsibility, build strong guilds with like-minded people, <clears throat> strong worker-owned businesses, become more relational, and lose the competitive mindset that we have around others in our field of work or in our lives, we can create our own means of exchange and support, and we become able to overcome adversity much easier. And just like our garden, go from striving to thriving. So our second uh, permaculture principle is called stacking functions. And a classic example of stacking functions is a story of chickens in the orchard. Um, I'm a little concerned that I'm a little concerned this may not work. I hope it will. Um, the last ones didn't, so this, bear with me. Um, in stacking functions, we're going to use this classic example of the chickens in the orchard, right? So as a farmer, it's not working. Okay. No visuals, guys. You're going to have to really work with me on this one. <laughs> so we have our chickens in a pen. We've got to go to the co-op, buy some food, bring them in, feed the chickens. Now they've pooped all over their pen, and I gotta go in, I gotta clean up all this poop, take it to the compost bin. I now have to go out to the orchard, and I'm gonna have to fertilize my trees. Oh, I gotta go back to the co-op and get some more fertilizer. Now I gotta, I've got some nice trees growing, and the insects move in. And in our current conventional way of doing things, oftentimes we spray for insects. So I gotta go back to the co-op, go get some, some spray, come back and spend time spraying my trees. And all of this makes for a very tired and dirty farmer. What if we just set the chickens free in the garden?
We'll just stop right here. What if we set the chickens free <laughs> in the garden? And so now the chickens are eating the bugs. I'm not having to feed them. They're cleaning up all of those um, the, the, the bugs that I would have normally had to go in and spray, so I'm not having to do that. They're pooping all over the orchard and fertilizing it. Now, I don't have to worry about cleaning up the poop or fertilizing the orchard. And I get to spend a lot more time hanging out in the hammock. So let's go ahead and put the idea of stacking functions to our communications of the party as an example. So we have, oh gosh, dang it all, dang it. Okay, so again, visualize here, folks. We have four, well, let's start with three committees. We've got a media committee, we've got the green pages, and we've got uh, a staff person and some other folks working on social media. And then we would like to have spokespeople. We'd like to have another group of folks that are out there doing communication for us. Now, each of these committees are working in their own little group. You know, the uh, Green Pages is working on storylines, finding writers, uh, doing layout, doing distribution. Media committees over, figuring out press releases, uh, quotes, finding people to take those quotes, doing their work. And um, social media, Starlene's doing a great job coming up with those sound bites that we can, little quick things for Facebook and Twitter. And I'm sure she has other people that work with her. But these are each small groups who are very overworked with all the stuff that they do. Um, so if we took this, the idea of stacking functions and applied it to the, the communications, we can put all of these groups all together in one group together that would have the idea of idea incubation, they would do copywriting, wordsmithing. And now we have a much bigger pool of people working together, collaborating, bouncing ideas off of each other. And the concepts can be developed in this larger group with then the various avenues doing their respective work. So the people in the green pages, they take these ideas, the phrasing, the message, and they flesh them out into articles. And the social media can take the concepts and figure out their little sound bites, their quick ways of doing it. And the media folks now have ideas that came from this collaborative wordsmithing session to work into the press releases and the quotes. And everyone can pull from the same pool of thought. Additionally, we now have lots of information that we could plug into those spokespeople who could go out and do things like radio interviews and TV shows and write articles and write blogs for alternative press. So say somebody hears an interview and then they come across one of our blogs and they go and check out the Facebook page <coughs> and then they go and pick up a copy of the Green Pages. Each time they hear a consistent message being articulated, nuanced for those different modes of communication, but still with a theme. And we create that strong set of ideas that enhance each other so that everything we put out is in relationship to the other messages we're sending. And we sound like a voice of the party rather than different entities within the party with each with their own message. So another advantage to putting these different entities together and to, is to support the people so they don't have to work so hard. You know, people when they're burned out and frustrated, sometimes the work can get sloppy, you know, because we're tired and we're overworked. But if you've got more personal time to go out and experience other things, you come back to the party work, you're rested, you're energized, you've got fresh ideas, and you've had experiences that will be, help you to be more creative and more inspired. And we go from striving to thriving. And in this way, we get to articulate our vision rather than simply talking about issues. We can clearly express how we're different, what we're gonna do, and how it's going to be effective. It's a great way to get a diverse group together to create and articulate the message in all those different modes of, of the communication that our party uses. It's just one way to apply the stacking functions concept 
uh, to party organizing, and we can take the same idea and, and apply it to any number of ways that we work within the party and create the same kind of effectiveness and efficiency. So our third seed is gratitude. Now, I have to say the single most powerful thing in my life came from implementing a gratitude ritual. When we express gratitude, I mean truly feel grateful for the many blessings in our life, from our health to the new day to opportunities that are coming, we become more open to feeling the beauty in the world and in our lives. The scientists have shown that practicing gratitude enhances people's lives and that makes them happier and healthier and more connected to the other people in the world. And it does this because gratitude affects our emotions, our beliefs, and all the way right down to actually in affecting our individual cells. So if uh, you're unfamiliar with the new science of epigenetics, I um, encourage you to check out Dr. Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Belief. It is really a fun and fascinating read and, and really sets a, a wonderful understanding of how these kinds of ideas can actually affect our physical health. So gratitude is fuel for transformative change. Each of our individual realities is dynamic and ever-changing. So when we express gratitude, we connect to today's reality, you know, because the present moment is the only constant we have. One of the most power powerful effects of gratitude is increased compassion. And by focusing on compassion, we can create a more just, peaceful, and sustainable world. And these are the very things that we are have put on our plate to do as Greens. You know, it's often easier to feel compassion for those that we love. It's a little bit harder to feel compassion for people who have views that are very different from ours or people that we perceive to be mean or hurtful or unjust people. And it's even hard sometimes to feel compassion for ourselves because in our culture, we're not really encouraged to be compassionate. Boys are not com really encouraged to be compassionate much at all. And girls are only encouraged to have compassion outside themselves. Because if you feel compassion for yourself, that's just being selfish. And these beliefs don't come because they actually had a conversation with us about compassion. They're just insinuated in what our parents and our teachers in our society do tell us. Like, join the team and beat the other team or you need to look out for yourself because nobody else is going to. Or, you know, don't be so selfish and eat your food. You know, there are people starving in the world. So in these insidious ways, we are instructed not to feel compassion. So a third element of, of gratitude comes in the form of grace. And I'm not referring to grace in a religious sense. I'm referring to it in how we express ourselves in the world. So one way to think of this is think of grace as a verb rather than a noun. Because unless it is active in our lives, it remains merely a concept. Grace is how we carry ourselves with strength. It can be giving someone a gift or doing a favor. It's forgiving someone or showing mercy. So you might not think grace is present in your life at this time, but it's only because of our perceptions. If we take two people doing the same activity, they're going to go out to the mailbox and collect the mail. They're going to ha they can possibly have two very different experiences. One might be thinking of all the other things they need to do, the bills that are inevitably in that mailbox, the argument they had earlier with their partner. While the other person notices the song of the birds nearby, or the laughter of the kids playing next door, or the smell of the blooming magnolia, they are in the moment. Those 60 seconds can fill our day with a sense of joy and beauty and wonder, or it can seem like an insignificant moment that was just more weight on an overburdened day. It's all in our perspective, and I encourage us to embrace the grace. Gratitude, grace, compassion are all keys that change our awareness. They take us from a life of rejecting and defending to one of acceptance and appreciation, a place to assess where we are, move forward, and create the world that we want to see. 
So my gratitude practice is I start each day before I get out of bed by expressing 10 things I'm grateful for. Five things outside of myself, five things inside of myself. And it can be difficult at first. You know, we're not used to doing this. And I didn't start with 10. You know, I started with three or four, and they were all outside of myself. Um, but over time, I became much more at ease with the idea of seeing things that I can be grateful for. They appeared in my life, and they made themselves visual to me much easier. And I was eventually able to even see them within myself. So something that I've noticed as I do this every morning is that the birds are sitting outside in the trees and they're singing. And it is one of the easiest things for me to grab and say, I'm grateful for this. Because they're right there in front of me. But I also notice that they don't start the day by eating until after they have sung for a while. So the expression that the early bird catches the worm just does not hold up, right? They don't rush out to get breakfast. They sit and sing and express their gratitude for the rising sun and the morning light. And when we do the same thing, our day is more peaceful and joyful and in support of everything we do the rest of the day. Because change begins inside. Let's take a moment now just to think of something that we're deeply grateful for. Don't put your hand on your heart for just a moment. And just think of something in your life today that you can be grateful for. How did that feel? We can tap into this feeling at any time we choose. Or we can choose to ignore it. Many of us did. It is our choice to make. There are these are the three seeds that I wanted to share with you today. And these are the three seeds that, among very many others, that have blossomed in my life, starting with a gratitude process that so completely changed my life, my health, my relationships, my purpose, that I began building guilds, stronger friendships, loves, and family ties. And finally, the seed of stacking functions has led me to a whole new career. So I want to share, share a really quick story about one of my clients. A couple years ago, a woman came to me and she said she wanted to improve her life, have a happier, more effective life, and, and, and stand up for herself. And so we started working together, and it was a great experience for her, and it impacted many areas of her life. And afterwards, she came to me and she said, I want to run for office. There is a state senator in my district, which happens to be the highest per capita district in Tennessee. It's very Republican. There's a state senator in my district, and he is so entrenched that the Democrats won't even run a candidate against him. Nobody will stand up to this man, and I want to run for that seat. And I said, great, let's go for it. So through the work, she had gained the confidence, the belief in herself, the willingness to speak her truth, and enough to take on this particular can candidate. And you might think that this candidate would be unfazed by an unknown green entering the race. But for him, it was enough to reach out to her and say, can we have a meeting? And so they talked. And you, know, you might say, well, yeah, he just wanted to know what she was about, what's going on, you know, find out what the is. And that's true. That is exactly right. But it was enough of, a, of a, a flag in his life that he just didn't blow her off as a fringy green. He felt it was important to find out who this woman really was. Now, Amy received 9% of the vote. Even though there were just the two of them in the race, and she had the support of the county Democrats who gave her access to their numbers, her, her, uh, their members, and uh, they endorsed her campaign. We felt really good about that 9% for the Green Party and for the members of that community because, after all, nobody stands up to Jack. So in addition to this experience, her day job is as a lead certification specialist uh, in the construction industry. So she works for a large construction company building houses for these very wealthy individuals. 
And her boss doesn't really appreciate her speciality or her duties um, so that she ends up doing a lot of things that don't have anything to do with sustainability. And she always felt like he didn't appreciate what she brought to the table. And, and like a lot of contractors, he's, he's loud and abrasive. And she felt a bit intimidated by him. And she didn't stand up for herself at work. And she had a lot of discomfort around her job because of this. And she let him get under her skin. And through the work that we were able to do, the atmosphere at work changed so greatly that she started standing up for herself at work. She didn't bring her work home. Um, she wasn't yelling at her kid all the time because of frustration because of work. She wasn't waking up in the middle of the night with anxiety. And she was able to speak her mind and ask for a raise. And they were pretty impressed, and she got that raise. And through this focus and this work that she was doing, and that not focusing on what a pain in the butt it was to go to work, she came to the realization that she didn't even like this job, and that she wanted to do something else. She has bigger dreams and a bigger impact to make. So her dream is to develop a community for the elderly, where they can live out their lives in dignity and do it sustainably in tiny houses to create a community of tiny houses where elderly live independent lives in community with friendship on their own terms. So she came to me again and said, you know what, I want to take this whole thing to the next level. Let's go another round. And so we started again. And within a couple of weeks, she got a call from an organization in her county that works with young people coming out of the foster care system. And these are young people who need to move out on their own. Their time with foster care is up but they don't have parents and grandparents, any kind of a support system to lean on once they get out in the world. And the statistics are crushing regarding these people. Um, a large percent of them end up in prison, and a large number of the women end up pregnant and unwed mothers within two years of leaving foster care. Like I say, the statistics are just astounding how uh, how their lives are not su successful after they leave. So this organization built a community center and they teach classes, life skills, stuff like that. It's a place for foster kids to come and inter inter uh, interact with other kids that have the same life experience as they do that understand where they're coming from and build strong relationships. And they got to thinking, you know what, wouldn't it be really cool if we built a bunch of tiny houses and gave homes for these kids to use for a couple of years. They could get out of foster care, they'd have some place to go, they'd have a house that they learned to take care of, responsibilities, they'd be around other people with the same issues and the same concerns they have, and we would still have our elders there to teach them life skill things. And so they called up Amy and had a meeting with her and invited her to be on their board to oversee this project. And since then, they bought the land. They've got a crowdfunding campaign out right now to raise the money to build the houses. And Amy is going to help oversee this project. Now, she still has her building uh, business idea in development. She's going to build her tiny houses for her elderly community. But in the meantime, she's able to take this more graceful space, this open mental mindset and work the, the techniques that she's learned to take her vision out into the world right now and do great things on a whole new level. So I tell you this story to illustrate how using these tools and coming together we can create a more dynamic, happy, joyful, positive life for ourselves where we can carry it into the world in magnificent ways. So along with the one-on-one -on -one work, I also do group work. And so I would love to open up a couple of small groups for people at this convention or, or Greens in general to come together and build ideas, bring your, your individual issues together that we can work on synchronistically, synergistically, and create 
a vision of what maybe could become Green Party policy and Green Party outreach. So if any of you are interested in that kind of work, that's what those cards are for. Put your name and your email and your area of interest and leave them on the table. I'll collect them afterwards. And, uh, and we'll get some groups together and, and see if we can't uh, build some synergy and, and go from striving to thriving with our issues. So how do we grow to become the stewards of this extraordinary time upon us? And in so doing, nurture ourselves, our families, and the whole world. This is a time of whole system transition. This is jump time, baby. This is jump time, big shifts in short time frames, changing the guard on every level. You know, we hear painful truths all the time. I'm not denying the pain that is truly out there, the issues that we are up against. It's not a pretty picture. But for a new world to be born, we need to become the parents of that new world. We need to bring a new mind to bear. And as we look at ourselves and the world around us, we see certain patterns in the way everything relates to everything else. And the exciting thing is, is we're not simply interconnected in a static web of relationships, but rather we are all spiraling onwards as the expanding universe is. Change is the only constant as part of the evolution surges through our veins and gives life to the new world. We have the skills to redesign our systems, our food systems, our land management, energy production, the built environment, as well as social, political, and economic systems. We can bring them all into balance with the natural world. We can build soil, harvest water, shift to renewable energies, pull carbon out of the atmosphere, and use it to generate fertility and true abundance. And we can create meaningful livelihoods in the process. This is the beauty of what the Green Party has to offer. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Um, the name of that book that you mentioned, uh, Gratitude, who is an author? Uh, the More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know is Possible. Okay, uh, Bruce Lipton's uh, The Biology of Belief. Biology of Belief and who's the author? Dr. Bruce Lipton. L-I-P-T-O-N, like the T. And, you know, it's a scientific read. It is very scientific. But he is just so fun. The way he tells the story, it's, it's super engaging and, and lots of fun. Bruce? One of the uh, current issues I've noticed Committees just don't work in this party. And I think you've given us a clue of why that is. I mean, committees are all separate. They have a mission statement, they have their rules, policies, procedures. They can't go and step on anybody else's territory, blah, 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 blah. And meanwhile, we just don't have enough people, uh, the skill, to go around, you know, like a platform. There's things I'd love to do with the platform. Starting with a, a one-page summary, it's two sides. Of, you know, do we ever get our platform down enough to we can focus and, and fit it on one page? That we can, you know, somebody who's interested in the Green Party, we should get it. You know, we should get whole thing. Anybody ever done canvassing? But it, it is, it's a wonderful but point. This, you know, but the point is, our organization, uh, we don't have enough energy to go around. And I think it's part of it. A big part of it is just going to the structure. We're not stacking things. We're not uh, creating communication between committees. You know, we tied up all these rules and mission statements and everything else. And, uh, we want to be relationship relational with the world outside and we don't practice that relational attitude within so it's it is hard to bring people in when you know you put up walls mm -hmm.
And I think that comes back to how we present ourselves, how we carry ourselves. Are we acting from this place of grace and compassion? Because we can get in a room full of people and sometimes we act a little bit better when we're seeing people face to face than we do on email and stuff. But by and large, we can still have very acrimonious meetings, even in person, and argumentative things. Um, so the mode of communication shouldn't matter so much as the way we communicate. And when we take it upon ourselves to first say, I'm going to come from a place of compassion, you know, and that rubs off, you know, and others take it on, and we all start stepping up then I don't think it matters whether we see each other face to face in the same room on a conference call uh, through email. They can all be respectful communications. It's just how we do it. I start, you know, I, I do, I start all my meetings with gratitude and everyone gets to take a moment to say one thing that they're grateful for. We go around the room and everybody does that. Um, because it just puts you in a whole different mindset. You know, All of a sudden you stopped thinking about it from the perspective of what is my agenda today? You know, What do I come here to accomplish or to get over on someone or whatever? Don, did you have a question? <laughs> yes, you may. I think there's probably another around. A couple more minutes. Anything else? Well, thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. I'm sorry that the slides didn't go because I had some really fun pictures of my, my chickens in my garden and <laughs> stacking functions and stuff. And we only got one of them. There were a bunch. <laughs> I had dirty farmers and... We're grateful for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, T. Thank you. Yeah, I am grateful too. Yes. Uh, ideas about events that could, that we might do, events that could be the same thing as the I, th I think, um, you know, like, I, like this offer that I'm making to, to get some groups together to just have these discussions, ad hoc, ad hoc get together with a couple people that you feel um, camaraderie with and talk. Just talk about it. Um, don't come in with an agenda. Don't come in with a purpose to get something done. Allow things to evolve organically. And then people get sparks of inspiration and all of a sudden a good idea pops out. You know, when we come with an agenda, we already know what we're going to do. You know? But when we come with just this open slate of just talking and just sharing, then it's amazing what can percolate up. You know, it's kind of that thing that, that, that we're learning about people who are dying. And so, so often when we have a loved one who's on their deathbed, and we want to say things that are hopeful or encouraging or, you know, maybe we even just try to make small talk because we feel like, okay, I'm here and I, I want to engage this person. When really all they want is for you to just sit there with them, hold their hand. And that way, if there's something deep inside of them that they would like to share before they pass, there is this opening, there is this place where this can can come. So I just encourage us as, as we all get older and we find ourselves with family members and loved ones passing on much faster now than it seems like they used to, at least for me. Um, you know, don't feel a need to soothe or to uh, make things better. Just allow. Just allow. Thank you all. Thank you.